Hi, I'm Sive. I also go by Swords and Spectacles online. I am an animator and illustrator, and today I'm going to teach you about how I use keyframes to animate my illustrations in Clip Studio Paint. First off, create a canvas, grab your favourite brush, and sketch out your character. This fellow here is a werewolf. Take some time, get the anatomy right, make sure you're happy with it, and then we can get on to the next step. Once I had my sketch to the stage where I was happy with it, I go over the whole thing all again. And what I'm doing here is I'm drawing each part that I want to move on its own separate layer. And it's very important at this point that you name the layers as well, because otherwise it'll be nearly impossible to keep track of them. I want his ears and his mouth to move, so I've put each ear plus his top jaw and his lower jaw on its own layer. I'm also putting his neck on its own layer. His chest, his near front leg and his near back leg all get to stay on the same layer because I don't intend for those to move at all. I don't intend for his far back leg to move either, but because the tail's in the middle that gets its own layer. And then his front far leg is going to be broken down into the shoulder, the forearm and the hand. A point as well on the tail, I find that when you're doing a character like this with a fluffy tail, it looks better if it's either a one piece or three pieces. Two just looks a bit awkward and like it's got a corner in it. Of course, this is not by any means a hard and fast rule. Now the next step will be to bring up the timeline. So go to window, then timeline. And if you're using pro rather than the X, you'll have a frame limit. The way to get the most bang for your buck out of this is to set your timeline to 12 frames a second and then two seconds to playback. Um, it'll be much smoother if you set your animation to 24 or 30 frames, but 12 looks just fine. And once you click OK, you now see why naming your layers is so important. This can look a little bit overwhelming, but just drag it up so it's got plenty of space on the screen, and now we'll get to talking about the keyframes themselves. Make sure you have the first frame of the animation selected. Now click the Enable Keyframes, Operation, and then Object. Make sure that you're on the first frame of the timeline, and then grab the little crosshairs in the centre of the canvas. This is the centre point around which your layer rotates, and it's the key to natural looking movements in your animation. Drag it to a natural joint, so for the top jaw we're going to place it around where the spine connects to the head. As soon as you have it where you want it, navigate to the end of the timeline and add a second keyframe with the Add Keyframe button. This ensures that your animation will loop properly. Now, pick a point in between your two frames on the timeline and rotate and move these how you'd like. Play it back to see if you're happy with the movement. The head in particular brings up a special issue. All parts of the head must have the same rotation when you start, at least, otherwise they can look like they're floating. So click and drag to select your keyframes, and then go Animation, Edit Track, Copy, or select the keyframes and right-click on them to do the same, and paste them from the same spot on the next layer down. It's important that these are not the regular copy and paste functions, they have to be the ones under the Animation tab. Once you have the start and end frames for all of the pieces of the head though, you can mess with the animation a bit more, like I'm doing with the lower jaw here. You can mess with basically any frame that isn't the start or end, so you can have the jaw opening more, you can have the ears flicking, there are a lot of options with what you can do here. At this stage I'm pretty rough with it, because this isn't going to be the final animation, but it helps me visualise how the final piece is going to look. So currently in the recording, I'm just going through and getting the head and the ears where I want them to be, and then I'm going to basically repeat the exact same process on the arm and the tail until we have a fully moving character. Now I'm just going to let the time lapse run, and I will pop back in if I see anything that needs comment. A note on the location of the keyframes for the hand, and by the way, when I say the keyframes, I mean like the frames on the timeline. You'll see that they're not in the same place as the head movement. This is just because if everything is moving at the exact same time, it can look a little bit artificial. Whereas if you have things that kind of start moving and stop moving at different times, it's a little bit more visually interesting. Thank you. 
Once you're happy with where your animation is, it's time to line everything. And the line art is going to be done similar to the sketch, except instead of placing everything on its own layer, everything goes into a named folder. We're using folders because it makes it a lot easier to animate later. Also, when lining your puppet, make sure to draw in lots of overlap. You never know how much you may want to push your puppet. It's better to be safe than sorry. The best example here currently is at his ears. The colouring process is fairly simple and I like to make use of Clip Studio Paint's reference layer feature to really speed up time. Create a new layer in the folder for the piece you want to colour, set the line art to reference layer, set the magic wand tool to respond to reference layers, draw lines on your colour layer to close the gaps, select the area outside of your object, invert the selection, fill the selection, deselect, unset your reference layer and move on to the next piece of the body. At this stage I like to colour every single piece in a different colour just because it makes it easier for me to then see where the puppet is, where the overlaps are in the colour, how kind of the lineless pieces of it will overlap with each other. And what's really nice about the reference layer setting is that you don't have to have all of the lines visible, you can just set to reference layer knowing you have your gaps closed on your colour layer and everything just works out quickly and perfectly because animating is slow and this saves time. Here there's an overlap between the upper jaw and the head that doesn't look very good, so I'm going to take in my eraser and make some clear space for the ear to move. The neck colour that's going to go behind both of these will hide the slightly awkward looking puppet pieces in the end. Honestly, this line and colour stage is really where you can end up doing a lot of back and forth to tidy your puppet up and make it look its best. You can see that on areas like the neck and later on the tail, I coloured the lineless portions of the overlap with a jagged, fluffy edge. This is so that the overlap looks fitting and like part of the character if it remains visible in the final product, more like a stylistic choice than an error in the pup's construction. And now it is back to our old friend, the timeline. I hide all of my layers just so I can have a look at my sketch and remind myself of what I'm doing. And then I take a second to tidy the timeline up by closing folders. This is just personal preference. Anyhow, I animate the exact same way I did with the sketch. It works the same way on folders. It also works the same way on animation folders if you want to do an animated blink or something like that. Just be aware that when you move a folder, grab the outside of the rotation box to move it rather than trying to click and drag on the layer. Clicking and dragging on the canvas itself will just pick up a layer instead of both layers in the folder. So just make sure that you're moving the whole folder rather than part of it. As you can see here, I'm not sticking strictly to what my sketch was. I'm having a bit more fun with moving his neck and having his jaw open and close. That's kind of the joy of puppets like this. You don't have to stick exactly to your plan. You can change it on the fly because everything is so separated out. It gives you a lot of freedom with how you want the character to move. Now, once you have keyframes enabled, if you ever want to edit or draw on one of the layers in your animated folder, there is either a little marker pen icon that you can click, but that will isolate only the layer, so here you can see it's only affecting the colour layer. Or you can just disable keyframes, which makes your whole layer still, but when you click the button again they'll come right back. So basically you're free to edit however you want, whenever you want. 
And from here I just animate the rest of the character again the same way I did the sketch. Just going through, playing back regularly to make sure I like what I'm doing. Going back, fussing things, fussing different layers as I need to. Once you're happy with how you've animated everything, it's time to get on to colouring it, and this is when it starts to look really good. Colour however you want, I use the lasso fill tool uh, a lot, but do whatever you want. Just colour in your usual way. As I mentioned earlier, if you turn off the keyframes, you can just draw on the layer completely normally, though I would say make sure you're on the first frame of the timeline to do this, otherwise everything else could look a little bit funny. All of your keyframes will be preserved and they will come back once you re-enable keyframes. Another important thing is to check your animation regularly to make sure that you haven't left any strange uncolored bits or any gaps, but that's quite easy to keep a handle on. Just regularly play back your animation. An advantage as well to the fact that you've keyframed the folders is that you can use your usual clipping masks or layer modes, whatever you want. They'll all work just perfectly normally within their own folders. And once you have the character coloured, play it back a few times, sit back and revel in what you've done. You've keyframed a fantastic looping character. But as you can see, there's a bit of time left more in the video because I also like to use keyframe animations in my backgrounds. So at risk of repeating myself, start drawing a background on its own layer in your usual way. You can see that I've put all of my animation layers into a folder, this doesn't affect them. What I like to do is I like to grab a 3D model just that comes with Clip Studio and use that to set up perspective rulers. I find it easier to visualise if I'm using the model. So as I say, just go through and draw your background normally. I've made just quite a simple one for this. Because the character is in his own folder, I can actually clip a shading layer to the folder, which I've just made with a dark blue set to multiply and use the airbrush to pull out a little bit of highlighting on him. Now the clipped layer will not move like the animation folder does, but if you're a little bit clever you can kind of cheat some very fast shading out of it. The first thing we're going to keyframe in the background is actually the street lights in the background. You can see that I've pressed the little plus by the folder with the street lights in it, and by adjusting the opacity after I've turned keyframes on, I can actually make opacity keyframes. And I'm putting them fairly close together with small incremental changes so that I can have a flickery street light, which I think adds a nice sort of atmosphere to the whole scene. And as with the animation on the character, play your animation back, check it regularly, and you'll be sure that you like what you're doing. And here you can see I'm applying the same technique to just a big airbrushy light over the scene. Again, just to affect the lighting of the scene to make it all feel a bit more dynamic. And to add the impression of a slightly windy day, I'm first drawing a still layer with various tuffets of grass around the place, and then what I'm doing is I'm making individual layers for individual grass tufts, and I'm animating those the exact same way I animated the character. 
So the process for those is just one new layer per grass tuft, draw it on with whatever your preferred brush is, use your colour picker to grab some shading and highlight colours from the other grass tufts around it, place your rotation point at the base of the grass tuft, animate it, uh, Bob's your uncle. And again, I'm making sure that none of these animations are happening at the exact same time or that everything's going in the exact same direction to keep it feeling organic and natural. And here I'm going in with just one big layer around where there's light from the windows and the street lamps and I'm keyframing opacity on that just to again add to that lighting effect. Then we're overlaying some shading layers, a gradient map, all my usual adjustments that I'd make before I called an illustration finished. If you want to remind yourself of the frame rate of your animation before you export it, you go animation, timeline, edit frame rate, and you can see it there. And then you can go file export animation and export your animation either as a video or as a GIF file. Now the one really important thing when you're doing this is when it gives you the option to select your frame rate, make sure it matches the frame rate of your timeline, otherwise it can come out not smooth or just looking a little awkward in its timing. So just make sure that those match. I'm going through the processes on both here just so you can see it. It's also worth noting that if you export as a GIF, Clip will automatically make it smaller than the canvas. You can fix this quite easily just by typing in the actual size of your canvas, but be aware that these files can get very big very fast, even if they are somewhat compressed. So once you've finished exporting your animation, open it up and take a look. This is the final product for what I made. I hope you learned something from this tutorial. Um, go off, have fun, and make some cool stuff.